back to the three secrets. I'm going to move on to secret number two. Um, and that is that after helping thousands of leaders, including ourselves, I'm going to talk a little bit about the real reason why you've tried to fix your employees' attitude and behavior, but you have failed. So let me ask you this. Have you ever had this experience, right? Have you ever had the experience where you have walked in to have a conversation with an employee to ask them to do something and they've simply said no to you? Have you ever had the conversation where you've said to employee, or ever had the experience where you've said to the employee, you know, you need to do such and such, or you need to do that such and such? I bet you have, because we all do it as leaders. We, I mean, it's we are trying to improve. We are trying to make it better. We are trying to figure out a way to help our employees get from where they are to where they need to be in order to support the collective success. But we've all had that experience where it seems like no matter what I do or what I say or what I try, because we do keep trying, that nothing seems to work, right? So secret number two, the real reason that despite all of your efforts to fix your employees' attitudes and behaviors, you're still failing to do it, we're going to look at what that is all about and what you can start to do differently. So let me go back to an example here. Um, so that you have a little bit of a sense or some, so, some of the stories that are behind it. Because again, I know you're not alone in this, and trust me, I've probably had all of your experiences and then some over the course of my career, not just working with my staff, but also with all the clients uh, where we've engaged with their employees and their, the dynamic between themselves and their employees. So the employee says, brand new employee, let me give you some bit of a backstory. So brand new managers come into this role. It's a brand new role in the organization. And their direct manager has said very clearly, I need you to do these things and I need you to have these meetings and I need you to get them organized right away because we want to make sure there's a really smooth transition. Um, and the senior leader um, re recognized that their new manager was not doing what they tasked them with doing, that, that somehow these meetings had not been set up and they weren't happening or they were being set up and the manager, the senior manager wasn't being included as was the expectation. So in having a conversation with this new manager about it, the new manager says, don't tell me you're going to micromanage me like this. If you do, it's not going to work for us. I'm not going to work for someone who micromanages me all the time. And the senior leader immediately, oh, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to micromanage, I just want you to be successful, and I really, you know, that wasn't my intention, and I wasn't trying to upset you, and I just want to make sure that this is getting done, but, you know, here we go. So who then in that dynamic, the senior leader is stepping back as opposed to moving into, into the conflict here, right? Or into the, or really staying focused on the issue, which is the issue is not about micromanaging. The issue is about whether or not the new employee is following the direction of their senior leader. But here, because the employee reacted and made accusations around micromanaging, and I swear this word gets thrown around so much, and so many leaders are afraid of being accused of micromanaging that they're not managing at all. They, they're just, they're so far hands off that they really aren't actually leading their, their people. So again, that, that same thing is so many leaders are not actually leading, even though they wouldn't necessarily think of it that way. Um, and because micromanaging gets thrown out as, as a word that means anytime you're trying to oversee, direct, or evaluate performance, leaders are getting accused of micromanaging. And that's not what micromanaging is about. Um, and so we have a misunderstanding in organizations today, both on the part of the leaders and on the part of employees, about microman what micromanaging is really all about. So here's the bottom line. Leaders are so focused on what employees are feeling or what they might be feeling, or afraid of what they might feel, uh, that they actually accommodate, adapt, or do the work themselves instead of getting their, their employees involved. So can you think about that? Can you think about a time when your employee, uh, where you were afraid your employee wouldn't like something you were gonna give them, say to them, do with them, ask them to do, and so instead, you either did it yourself, or you went to them with a, oh, do you mind, can you do me a favor? It would be really helpful if you could. I would really appreciate it, and it would mean a lot to me. Um, or, you know, that's that adapting. Or where your employee got upset about something, and you said, okay, fine, don't worry about it, I'll take care of it. Um, again, that's accommodating, adapting. And that's because we're so focused on those feelings and emotions and the, the reactions of our employees that we've stopped shifting into leading it. 
Um, and so leaders are making the mistake of giving that power again to their employees instead of developing the actual skills that are necessary to deal with employee behavior and to direct and manage performance. It goes back to the fact that this is a skill set. But if we're giving our power to our employees, it really is because we don't have the skills to figure out how to navigate all of that complexity around employee emotions and their behaviors and how that translates into performance. I know when I first started leading, I had zero training and no idea what I was doing. And I was just trying to do something out of the kind of the sheer force of my optimism and my, you know, let's go, we can do this. But when it came to, to actually managing performance, and some of these people were older than I was that I was trying to manage the performance of, I had no idea and if they got upset with me I didn't know how to deal with it other than to take back the work and to and to fix it and to make it better myself and so if you're like me you might be thinking but I've tried everything already I mean I really did believe the whole time I was starting out leading was that I was doing the right things and I was because I was trying I was trying to lead I was trying to be effective but it was trying it was trial and error it wasn't actually leading now that I look back on it but at the time I was simply so focused on trying and doing the best that I could do with the skills and the tools that I had in my toolbox at that time, which was very, very limited because I had not had any development at all. Um, and, and so, of course, I, it, it was running up against the wall. But I did feel exhausted from it a lot of the time. I felt like giving up um, because I felt like I tried everything. And that's why this was so fundamental when we discovered what it truly takes to uh, be able to lead with potency and to lead with authority, um, that it just was a game changer for me and as we've seen it with our clients. So here's another one, sound familiar? I love this one because it, it really it really speaks to that not knowing, you know, sometimes employees say things and we're just like, what do I say to that? Like, I don't even know how to react to that because that's so unbelievable that that just came out of their mouths that, okay, fine, uh, I'm just gonna walk away from it. So one of our clients uh, had a, a relatively new employee who was getting started and, and this new employee, part of her job was to sit in on meetings um, and to take the notes so that the team or the group knew what they were to do afterwards. Uh, it was also, she was given a lot of tasks that were downloaded onto her um, and so she had to follow through on all of those tasks and they weren't necessarily repeatable or um, recurring tasks, so a lot of one-off things. So the leader noticing that some of the things were falling through the cracks and maybe she was missing some things or that the notes weren't coming back from meetings that the way she'd expected, she said, you know, it might be helpful if you actually took notes to when we're in meetings. Um, and that way, whether we're in meetings just the two of us or we're in meetings with a group, that way we're not going to forget anything or miss anything. And the employee's response was, well, yeah, I hear you, but I don't take notes. That's just not my work style. It's not how I learn. My preference is just to sit there and to listen to what people are saying so that I can take in the information that way. So what do you do as a leader, right? What is it that you do? And if in this case, what the leader did was she didn't even know how to respond because it felt like there was nothing, nothing left to discuss. Um, and interestingly enough, in, there was a point in time in the evolution of organizations where if an employee did that, it would be considered insubordination. Um, but today, employees feel entitled to make those sorts of comments, but then leaders feel powerless and ill-equipped to, to deal with that. Now, how do I resolve that and how do I deal with that? So if you're going through life to trying to keep your employees happy, because that's a big driver these days. Um, and in fact, if you go out to the bookstore, you go online and you look for employees happy and you do a search for that, and you will see all of the books that have been written about keeping our employees happy. Um, but if, if that's your goal, if that's your agenda as a leader, that your employees never feel any discomfort, any frustration, any angst, any you know being pushed out of their comfort zone, any um, having to shift their behavior uh, in order to develop, if you're going through life as a leader, just trying to keep your employees happy, you are really setting yourself up for unhappiness and ultimately for failure. And you really are keeping yourself stuck as a leader um, because we can't lead if our goal is to uh, keep them happy. Um, and I love this quote from Steve Jobs because it says everything about it. If you want to make everyone happy, don't be a leader, sell ice cream, right? Because in reality, part of being a leader is making some of those difficult decisions, setting direction, creating boundaries, saying no when no needs to be say, said, saying this didn't work out the way I wanted to, right? This, this isn't the result I was looking for, your performance fell flat, or there's too many, whatever it is, 
it's we're going to say things we need to say things and we need to do things um, that are not necessarily going to allow our employees to stay in that happy notion of happy um, and in fact we've worked with very senior leadership teams in very large organizations where they have not gone forward on decisions that they know are in the best interests of the business because they're too afraid that their employees will get upset and it's never all of the employees I mean there might be a couple of them who are very vocal but they're so afraid of upsetting anybody that they actually do nothing they will do nothing to resolve issues and then the organization suffers the collective suffers uh, because again we're so busy protecting um, our employees from their emotions so what I'm talking about this doesn't mean that you have to be nice you don't have to suck it up you don't have to keep your mouth shut it's not about making them feel special because all of that that leaders are doing today all of that being so focused on I want to be nice I want to be seen as the good guy or the great girl um, and I just suck it up and so you know you've probably done this where you've had a conversation with an employee where you wanted to say something else um, or you your res immediate response that was coming to you but you just sucked it up you just sucked it up and you kept your peace and you said I'm not gonna pick this battle I'm not gonna I'm I'm just going to work around it. Um, we see that happen all the time. We hope see it happen between leaders and their employees, but we also see it between peers uh, and even in conversations between a leader and their direct manager, uh, which again, you're not leading in that context and that's a huge part of the problem. So secret number two, now you know that you must master your triggers and how you react to others, to their behavior, to their emotions, if you're actually going to eliminate entitlement and the bad behavior or the poor attitudes that come with them. 